Well, good day everybody, and welcome to this edition of iPhone Conservative. Bullfighting. For hundreds of years, it's captivated the imaginations of people throughout the world. Celebrated in song, literature and film, and immortalised by Hemingway in his novel The Sun Also Rises, the Karida continues, despite its undeniable cruelty, to exert a fascination on the human mind. Bullfighting is awash with spectacle. It dresses itself in pomp and pageantry. Its history and ethos is focused on personal courage and triumph against the odds. And of course, many are lured for the ever-present spectre of death that awaits it in the wings. But at its heart, bullfighting is a ritualized contest, a combat between man and an elemental force of nature. A lone man is pitted against a bull. Now, on the face of it, there should be no contest. The matador, though armed with a sword, faces a creature infinitely stronger and swifter. A bull is almost 300 pounds of pure bone-crushing muscle, possessing speed and reflexes quicker than the man he faces and armed with razor-sharp horns and hooves. However, the bull, despite all its natural advantages, is invariably doomed. Why? Well, because the bull possesses one fatal flaw. It is incapable of identifying the actual threat it faces. And it's that flaw that I want to examine today, containing as it does an important lesson for Western democratic societies. In the arena, the bull repeatedly charges the cape that the matador waves before it, expending its energy, trying to come to grips to lock horns with what it perceives as a threat. Each time it does so, the real adversary, the matador, stabs it in passing. Not a mortal blow, but rather a wounding strike, designed to let its life's blood drip out onto the sand, weakening it with every passing moment. The West is just like that bull. We too are locked in a mortal struggle with an adversary that on the face of it is vastly weaker. But like the bull, we are unsure as to where the threat lies. In the decade following the events of 9-11, many people came to use the term radical Islam to describe the enemy we face. However, the broad nature of the term, containing as it does a multitude of actors, has seriously impaired our ability to effectively counter the designs of our enemy. Sunni, Shia, Islamist, Jihadist, Political Islam, Islamic Fundamentalism, Quranic Literalism, Wahhabist, Salafist. The terms are virtually endless and they reflect the confusion that permeates the West concerning the nature of the threat we face. It's significant that the West chose to declare war against a tactic rather than the enemy that employs it. Our true enemy, the one more common denominator between all these disparate groups waved the largest flag it possessed and invited the West to charge in. The West declared a war on terror. But terrorism is not a civilizational threat. For terrorism to effectively threaten Western civilization, it would have to happen on such a scale continuously that it would no longer be terrorism, but by definition, war. And in a state of war, the West's superior military might would ensure our enemy's destruction. Our enemy understands this. It knows that it cannot lock horns with the West. It's too weak. And so it deliberately aids the West's confusion by throwing up a multitude of red flags, both geopolitical and societal, inviting the West to rush in to expend its resources in combating false threats all the while standing poised to deliver another debilitating cut. Its strategy, just like that of the Manadors, is one of attrition, of continually wounding the West, weakening it with every passing moment, until at last, on trembling legs, the West stands exhausted, awaiting the coup de grace. Within our societies, the enemy is engaged in daily provocations, designed to challenge Western moral and cultural values, female genital mutilation, the burqa, halal accreditation, 
the continuing attacks against our traditions of free speech. These are all deliberate provocations, red rags that are waved in front of our noses, inviting us to charge forward whilst the real threat stands ready once again to wound us as we pass. So, who is this adversary? What is the common denominator that links a jihadist organisation like Al-Qaeda with an Islamist organisation like the Muslim Brotherhood? What's the unifying idea between otherwise mutually antagonistic Sunnis and Shias? Well, the answer to that question came to light due to the discovery of an amazing document. Uncovered by the FBI during the Holy Land Foundation trial, America's largest terrorist funding investigation, the document titled An Explanatory Memorandum on the General Strategic Goal for the Group in North America, but known more simply as The Project, and written by Muslim Brotherhood operative Muhammad Akram, sets out in chilling detail radical Islam's plan to destroy the West from within. And for the first time, it allowed us to openly see the shape and designs of the enemy we face. Now, Akram was well aware that terror attacks would not be sufficient to bring down Western civilization, and in fact, could prove counterproductive as Islam became increasingly connected in non-Muslim minds with terrorism. As such, what he termed as the Grand Jihad should focus exclusively on creating and extending organizations with one goal in mind, to undermine and ultimately destroy Western civilization by the promotion and implementation of Islamic law, in other words, Sharia. Sharia is both the means and the ends that radical Islam strives for. It's the doorway, the channel, if you like, through which Islamic fundamentalism must flow. It's the common thread the unifying theme between the Muslim Brotherhood and Al-Qaeda and between Sunni and Shia. And it is from the Sharia, or the desire for its implementation, that all these provocations arise. Sharia is the enemy. It is antithetical to every Western idea of equality that we hold. Women's rights, legal protections for gays and other minorities, freedom of speech and conscience, the separation of church and state. All of these values are seriously weakened by any implementation of Sharia law. Now let there be no mistake in this. Sharia is not only incompatible with democracy, it is fundamentally oppositional to it. Yet, despite the obvious dangers that it poses, Sharia continues to be presented as a benign addition to our existing legal structures. The strategy outlined in the project has succeeded beyond Muhammad Akram's wildest hopes. Halal is fast becoming the default position for meat production. Sharia courts are operating in numerous Western countries. The burqa, a direct affront to traditional women's rights, remains largely unchallenged. And blasphemy laws the prohibition against any criticism of Islam have become the new normal within our mainstream media. Now, however dire the situation appears, there is cause for hope. In America, a number of states, most notably Tennessee and Arizona, are attempting to introduce legislation to ban or seriously curtail the imposition of Sharia into their states. Now, they face serious opposition from the Obama administration, which has been heavily infiltrated by operatives of the Muslim Brotherhood, and also a cowardly and complicit media, which are more interested in following the articles of cultural sensitivity than the reporting of facts. But it can be done. We can turn the situation around. But only if each of us are prepared to get involved, to make the effort, to support those elected representatives who have the courage to oppose Sharia and to remove those politicians that don't. To stop buying from those retailers that put halal products on their shelves and to demand that our schools discontinue the promotion of Sharia in their curriculums. If we, the people, 
the inheritors and the custodians of Western freedoms refuse to give up, refuse to be silenced, and like that bull in the arena, no longer allow our adversary to distract us with false flags and diversionary targets, then perhaps, just possibly, something amazing can happen. That's gotta hurt.